Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us for our final Pioneers event of the year. I'm Rachel Arthur and I'm the co-founder of Fashmash. For those of you joining us for the first time, we are a members only network aiming to encourage dialogue and sharing of ideas to shape the future of fashion. And wow, do we have an important topic tonight on exactly that note. Before we begin, let me first say thank you to our sponsor for the evening, Clavio, an e-commerce marketing platform supporting brands such as Heist, Hummingbird Bakery, Chubbies and Living Proof. Whether you're an entrepreneur just starting out or part of a marketing team at a multinational brand, Clavio aims to give you everything you need to create memorable marketing moments through email, text and personalized web experiences. We highly recommend you give it a go. So just visit clavio.com slash bashmash for your free trial. We're also really thrilled to be supporting the Prince's Trust and Shelter tonight, charities of our speaker's choice, which is how we have been operating all of our events throughout 2020. It means we've supported an incredible variety of different causes this year. So thank you all for your contributions. They are hugely appreciated. If you would still like to donate and you haven't yet, our Eventbrite page will be open for the rest of the evening. So do please give generously if you can, especially at this time of year. So on to the main event itself. In hosting this interview tonight, we are highlighting a new topic for this series and not a moment too soon as it's one that's tearing apart the traditions that we know. The streetwear market is now worth a huge $50 billion and, is ex and it is expected to see double digit sales growth over the next four years. In recent times, we have seen a wealth of acquisitions in this space, including just recently that of Supreme to VF Corp for 2.1 billion, which we'll be talking a little bit more about tonight, I'm sure. This is a topic that is redefining the fashion industry in so many ways, impacting luxury hugely over the past few years, and now evolving and changing at pace once more as we live through this pandemic and beyond. For those of you who know her, you will all be very excited to see what Rosanna, my co-founder, is wearing accordingly this evening. The most visual representation of disruption if ever you've seen one. I will leave that one hanging until she arrives. In our bid to really showcase the topics that are shaping the future of the industry, we knew it was high time we honed in on streetwear. We wanted our final speaker of 2020 then to be a trailblazer in this field, which is why we're so excited to be hosting Mark Jacques Burton, Creative Director of MJB. Established in 2015, his brand is influenced by the London punk scene of the 70s, the New York art scene of the 80s, and a love of hip hop, rock, and skateboarding. It has already gained renown for dressing musicians on and off stage from Young Thug to Marilyn Manson. It has also been worn by Tom Hardy, Black Coffee, Paul Pogba, Gigi Hadid, Winnie Harlow, and many, many more. This is a man who knows exactly what is what and who is who in this space, leading to incredible collaborations from video games to comic books, music, and more to a view on what the big creative directors of the future look like and just how to appeal to the aesthetic of Gen Z. I, for one, cannot wait for this thought-provoking exploration. So do make sure you join in the conversation as well using the hashtag FashMash on social media throughout. And do please prepare any questions that you might have for Mark yourself too. You can pop them into the Q&A box here on Zoom and we will be sure to ask them at the end. Without further ado then, it's my pleasure to welcome Mark and Rosanna. If you would both like to please turn your videos on. The visualization that we mentioned. Yep, there we go. Hi, good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm very proudly wearing Mark Shack Burton this evening in very bright colors. And I couldn't think of a better way, better thing to wear on a, on a gloomy December day. Mark, I am so delighted to welcome you here. Uh, the conversations that we have already been having in preparation for this Zoom call have really stimulated my mind and challenged my view on the industry, which really in the midst of lockdown 2.0 is pretty hard, you know, yep. is pervasive right now. But you have challenged me completely and um, I can't wait to share 
all of your all of your thoughts with with everyone here this evening. Um, so to get started, yeah. Last year, Virgil Abloh declared streetwear is dead, but then 2020 happened. You know, 2020, we're talking sweatpants forever, as the New York Times said. Then there's the casualization of the fashion industry that um, you, clearly the pandemic was a catalyst in there, loungewear lockdown moments all round. And then as Rachel mentioned, we had Supreme being bought for $2.1 billion um, by VF Corp last month. And that was three yep. times its valuation three years ago. So clearly they've weathered any storm of streetwear being dead. And I wanted to kick off with a very big question mark. Is streetwear dead? That's, it's a really interesting question, Rosanna. Thanks for posing that. And I think it all ref, you know, refers back to the actual term, what is streetwear? Because as, as you said, you know, there's been a lot of acquisitions going on in the world, in the industry. And, you know, there are more and more people interested in that type of fashion. And it is something that is continually growing. And I think it is a real actual element of fashion. And it's something that real people are actually wearing in the real world. So for me, it's actually, you know, growing. And I've just seen the growth. And, and I think there's a huge excitement and passion for it, which has been seen over the course of the last pandemic. So I would disagree and say that streetwear is not dead I feel like it's just naturally evolving and growing up and becoming more and more um yeah it's just changing and evolving like all things do um and I think that a lot of the designers you know that started off um initially in in the so-called streetwear field started off just making t-shirts you know um you know, Virgil's first brand, Pyrex, he, he was, you know, silkscreen printing on champion t-shirts and hoodies and Ralph Lauren. And now he is the creative director of Louis Vuitton. And I think you've just seen this evolution of what people are, are working on. And now they've got far, far bigger canvases to paint on and, and far bigger resources. Now, you know, yes, Virgil may, long, may no longer be um, printing, you know, just on t-shirts and he's designing incredible couture pieces at Louis Vuitton. So I think it, it's just the natural evolution that has taken place. And do you think that evolution is down in part to the fact that the term became overused, perhaps over commercialized by brands trying to tap into it as a phenomenon? Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of designers, um, probably including Virgil, um, you know, I think a lot of designers wouldn't necessarily agree um, of being coined streetwear designers. I think fundamentally, um, you know, there's a lot of lot of very, very talented people. And I think that sometimes the term streetwear was, was used and almost looked down upon certain designers for just being streetwear designers, when in fact, they had a lot more depth to them and creativity. And I think that's now being strongly reflected in a lot of these so-called streetwear designers now heading up some of the biggest couture houses in the world, um, such as Virgil at Louis Vuitton, Matthew Williams at Givenchy. So I think there's been a strong evolution there. Um, that's, and that's disrupting the entire luxury industry. And I want to talk to you about luxury a lot more. I guess just if we just hone in on, on your brand a bit more, Rachel uh, covered your biography succinctly in her introduction. When yes. you started it five years ago, did you intend to start a streetwear brand? Was that, your def was that in your definition, your company ethos? No, it wasn't um, in the company ethos. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't planned. I think, um, I think with a lot of the young fashion brands that are around today that are now categorized as streetwear brands, I think that, you know, we've all, um, yeah, the door was opened by people like Virgil Abloh, Heron Preston, Jerry Lorenzo, and even Kanye West. And I think they showed um, all of us that you can actually start a brand by just making one product. And I think around all of us were t-shirts and hoodies and very simple items. So I think, um, I think all of those guys showed us that they hadn't come from formal training backgrounds. They, they, they didn't study fashion. They didn't study design. And so it, it gave hope 
um, and a realization to many people like myself, like actually you can just start with one item and it doesn't have to be a brand. I think a lot of us started just by creating pieces that we wanted to wear and naturally people around us gravitated to it and things built organically. Like, yeah, with me, there was no real long-term plan at the start. I just wanted to make unique pieces that no one else had. That was my basic goal when I started. I, I was slightly, um, yeah, I was bored of going into stores and finding pieces that were just, you know, globalized and sold everywhere in the world. And I missed the fact that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you could go to New York and you could find pieces that no one had in London, or you could go to another city. And, and that disappeared kind of 10 years ago with globalization, where you suddenly found the same brands all over the world. So they were putting out the same collections all over the world. So this globalization meant that there was less uniqueness in the marketplace, which I felt was lacking. Um, so, so that was my main ethos upon starting was let's create unique, very small run of small run pieces. Um, so that's how we started. And we should actually define what those small runs were. It was bespoke leather jackets hand illustrated by you, right? Yeah, that was it. You know, I think um, when you're starting off, you don't have the biggest, you know, pool of resources. And so, you know, I think a lot of us were self-trained, you know, a lot of the guys that um, are sold next to me in, in the stores that I'm sold at. So I think, yeah, you, you just kind of start with what you've got. So with me, it was initially you know, making leather jackets or finding vintage leather jackets, vintage denim, vintage bomber jackets. And I was just integrating art into, into the pieces. And that really built traction. And I felt that I was able to, to kind of create unique pieces and one-offs by just, you know, simply having art um, that was relevant for one person. So that's how we started. We just made unique pieces and then it built from there. Now, the, the, we've already been touching upon the luxury industry. Yeah. Streetwear is, is disrupting it. They began to converge in 2017. Uh, Louis Vuitton collaborated with Supreme, Ralph Lauren um, collaborated with Palace more recently. There are so many that we could list. Yep. Um, and we witnessed luxury desperately trying to get in on the hype model of, of streetwear. That might yes. be drops, it might be logo mania. Um, all are all of these when in the luxury lens are they they marketing ploys for luxury or actually is it a long-term commitment to streetwear has luxury changed forever yeah I, I i think you know they're really interesting relationships and i think something that um a lot of the younger brands have done is, is just develop this art of collaboration and i think you know the the, the best example of that was supreme um, and, and they just did really, really unusual out of the box collaborations. And, you know, one of them being Louis Vuitton, but before they got to being able to collaborate with Louis Vuitton, they would create, you know, really random and fun um, collaborations. You know, they, they've made, they've done a, a brick before, you know, they've done lighters, they've done playing cards, they've done really random pieces that were fun. And I think you know, Supreme and a lot of other brands, they haven't taken themselves too seriously and they've just been able to create um, fun things. So I think part of the art of a really strong collaboration is when something is, almost seems like it shouldn't fit together. Um, and so I think that's where you get Louis Vuitton and Supreme or Palace and Ralph Lauren, you know, in theory, you would never, ever think, you know, when Supreme and Palace were founded, no one could have ever, ever imagined that one day they would collaborate with such brands as, as Louis Vuitton and uh, Ralph Lauren. And I think that's part of the beauty of it is that these brands, you know, Supreme was started in 94 and they, they've grown so quickly. And, you know, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a really interesting relationship where I think that um, by Louis Vuitton working with Supreme, it's given that kind of credibility and that kind of acceptance by the older, more established fashion brands. And I think it's also shown that they've been open um, and they've seen the importance of the younger brands and they've realized that um, it's really necessary to embrace the younger brands, which I think is great. And I think that historically in the past, some of the bigger, more powerful established brands would often 
steal and copy ideas from younger brands. And I think what's wonderful to see now is that when a big luxury house sees something within a younger brand, um, they will now respectfully ask and do a collaboration, which I think is really wonderful to see because I think in the past fashion has been, you know, um, a culprit of a lot of kind of theft within brands, you know, copying and stealing each other. Whereas I think with the new wave of, of young brands, I think that we respect each other. And I think there's, you know, um, a real acceptance of what people are, are known for and specialized for. And then that's why people collaborate rather than copying. So I think, I think that's evolved. And I think it's something that's, that's really beautiful. So it sounds to me from what you're saying that you feel luxury has changed forever in that it's become more accepting of these younger brands through yeah. collaboration. And it's not something that's just a flash in the pan. Yeah. The last few years, and they're now going to go back to their state old ways. Yeah. And and I, I think I think the reality is is that you know the younger brands are now just too powerful. They're too influential because I think that the younger brands they're very, very connected to the people who who you know buy the products. And if you look at a lot of the, the younger designers, you know. You, you see someone like Virgil, he's so humble and he's so connected to, to, to all the youngsters and he wants to build and uplift people. And I think that's what all the new designers have done. They're very, very interlinked um, with, with the people, you know, that the, the buy from them. Uh, just on that, um, I, I the, the, the luxury versus streetwear as it was, the, I suppose um, the Supreme deal is the kind of big news in the last few yep. months of this year. And what struck me about that is actually the company that have bought it are mid-market apparel and they have North Face, Timberland, Vans. So do you think actually that marks a move of streetwear away from luxury and into a more mid-market space? Or do you think that's just, it makes sense for the stable of brands? Yeah, I, I think it makes sense for that stable of brands because if you look at that stable of brand, they've often been collaborating with Supreme. And I think what's been super, super interesting with, with Supreme's model is that they've always kept the pricing very, very reasonable, you know, yeah. and very accessible for a lot of people. And what Supreme has done so incredibly well, and I think so many other brands have, have mirrored and followed suit thereafter is that Supreme has created the luxury and the hype and the demand through scarcity. So they've mm -hmm. kept the price point very, very reasonable and they've created a new type of you know, luxury and demand th through having you know, such a scarce um, amount of product made each time they do a launch. So um, yeah, I think Supreme um, will continue with, with that model. And I think it, it, it's, it's only very exceptionally you know, collaborated with with a Louis Vuitton. They've only done one collaboration with high end, oh, I, I you know, and in general, you know, Supreme is you know always collaborating with with you know more mass market brands that are that are very accessible. And I think that's what's so powerful about the Supreme business model: how it is actually not um, based on price and high pricing. It's based on scarcity and and real creativity of working with with you know different brands. And that's so interesting what you say there, because it's been on my radar when it's collaborated with a luxury brand, because that is my bubble and my world. Yeah. And, and I need to realise that streetwear is disrupting my world. And, and yeah. this is so good we're having this conversation. So you have led on as if you read my mind, scarcity. And you actually yes. mentioned something there about how luxury fashion, it was typically unattainable because of the price point. Yeah. And the thing about like supreme is it was it is hugely desirable but its attainability is actually through so it's it, it, the desirability become comes through scarcity um yeah. much of this hype that i we keep that is so strongly associated with streetwear is due to limited edition product drops um as we mentioned at the start your bespoke leather jackets that you started with i mean you can't get more limited edition than that and and they they you know you gained renown for it at the start of your career if we look at the limited edition product runners as as a topic here um is it is it scalable 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, definitely scalable. Um, you, if you look at, you know, a lot of brands, you know, they're just consistently doing small runs, which I think is really great because I think the product is actually then demanded. It's, it's then also, you know, there's no excess stock and wastage. Yeah. Um, because if you look at a lot of the, the, you know, the incredibly powerful luxury brands, they, you know, they've tended to, you know, it's, it's only come out recently, but they've tended to actually burn stock or bury it, you know. And you think, you know, what I love about, um, you know, the younger designers is that we do very small runs. And actually, when people buy the product, you know, they, they treasure it more. Um, and they, they tend to look after it. And, you know, and there's also that the resale market. So it's, it's created kind of a new income source for, for a lot of people. Um, and yeah, so I, I think it's really positive. And, and you look at a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the drops, they're done incredibly consistently. You know, you look at a brand like Supreme or Palace, you know, they, they are doing weekly releases. Um, and you see that, you know, you see it with other brands like Kith, you know, they are doing, you know, they're doing probably a new launch every month. So it is really sustainable. And I think it is the new way. And I think the younger generation of consumers are, are much more aware of the environment, how products are made. So I think that this form of, um, you know, dropping products in limited edition quantities, I think it's also um, a more sustainable route as well. Because Mark, you've actually, I think you misheard me, but I'm delighted that we've covered that side of things. I actually asked if it was, if it was scalable. As in yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and I agree. It, it, it is scalable. Yeah, it is. You know, it's, and it, 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 it's scalable it's through, through the consistency that you can do these releases. Whereas, you know, a typical fashion brand might do, you know, a classic fashion brand may do two to four collections a year with pre-collections in summer and winter. And I think the younger generation of brands, they are just, you know, doing launches um, far more consistently throughout the year, as in like every week or every month. So yeah, it's definitely scalable. And, and the, what I was mentioning earlier about these other forms of scarcity that aren't just driven by price point like luxury always was, um, I found this quote on Vogue Business that I loved. Jen said consumers increasingly seek streetwear that ties them to a cultural event or community. They want scarcity, scarcity based on being there. That's yep. an important thing for them. What's your experience of that? Yeah, I think that is, you know, it's something very special because I think that with um, along with you know what you want to call streetwear are true subcultures you know of you know music hip hop skate surf you know and th these are real um, cultures that that people live and breathe and I think that you know now you know a lot of people they no longer want something that a lot of people can have and I think um, you know a, a lot of brands you know such as supreme is you don't need to be on the waiting list to to get a supreme product you actually have to physically go there and queue and that's what i think a lot of gen z um are really interested in is like putting the time into acquiring items that they want and being there in the moment and i think you know it's uh, you know it's fascinating how linked they are with with the music and they're so so um, the two worlds, music and fashion, is so interrelated. And now, you know, musicians are just so important to the fashion business. And it's wonderful to see how um, musicians experiment so much with fashion and drive it forward. And now you've got, you know, a lot of amazing musicians who are, you know, doing um, product lines with fashion brands or their own product lines and their own merchandise. Um, so I can see why people do want that experience of, of having an item, but also it having a link to a moment in their life as well. And you've actually linked perfectly to, to music, which is something that obviously your brand was built on. I think really for this next, because we're kind of halfway through and the next area that I want to concentrate on is the disruption, um, the way you approach your brand in a, in a not a typical way that a, a, a fashion brand that was five years established might be, be have typically been approached in the past, but then also how dis streetwear is just disrupting the industry in general. That's what we keep coming back to. So first of all, when it comes to celebrity dressing, 
I'm sure all of our viewers here this evening know that the the celebrity celebrity dressing is, is key to fashion PR marketing. It's it's the kind of age old adage when you're starting a brand. Um, and I think while we're examining the evolution of streetwear, it, it actually is a lens to examine the, obviously the way dressing in general has transformed and therefore the way celebrity dressing has transformed. Um, really celebrity dressing it used to be red carpet it bags glamorous formal wear and it was for press events yeah and yours is the antithesis of this you're a complete disruptor of the space um with names from future to gd hadid they're wearing casual wear when when you dress them and i just think so many people on this call will will want to know your secret you know how do you get started uh dressing celebrities of that caliber yeah, I think, you know, with us, we've been very blessed. It's been a very organic and natural process. And it's something that we haven't worked at. It's just um, we've been embraced by a lot of different worlds, which I'm super grateful for. I think, you know, I think it's important to remember that a lot of the top musicians, actors, artists in the world, um, you know, th th the reason why they're so popular is because they're very authentic. And I think that they proudly accepted who they are. And I think they've demonstrated um, their unique personalities. And I've seen a real boldness in a lot of them. And through that accepting acceptation of who they are, I've found that they've wanted clothes that then reflect that and embody that. So that's what I've always tried to do as the designer. And like, I'm, I've luckily, you know, worked with a huge number of musicians and I, I saw their lives and, um, you know, before the pandemic, um, it was incredible to see just how hard a lot of musicians work. They are continually touring. They're, they're flying all over the world. They were doing concerts. They were writing albums, releasing singles all at the same time. Um, and so I, I, just, I just understood their kind of their needs and, and created clothing that, that would re reflect that. Um, and kind of was different. And I think that's what a lot of people wanted. So um, yeah, that was important to me. You did say something to me when we last spoke about this that I loved. You said, because throughout your career, it's been about making people feel special. Yeah. And you said, really, I'm trying to design something that makes people feel special. Yes, and yeah. That it's volumes when it comes to celebrities, right? Yeah, because I think no matter who you are, I think that some days we feel good, some days we, we don't, um, and some days we need um, a boost, you know? And I think that um, clothing can, can give someone that, that temporary boost that they need um, to, to, feel, to feel as good as they can. So I feel it's my job to create clothing where either people can feel very comfortable and therefore very relaxed and, and, and they feel good in that way, or I can create types of clothing that are more extreme and artistic that will bring out the the kind of the more extravagant and um side to that artist because they're in different positions you know sometimes they're traveling they need to be in more comfortable clothes and sometimes they're in front of the cameras or they're on stage so um you know that needs to be taken into consideration but yeah the bottom line is is like when i'm designing i want people to feel as good as they can about themselves when they're when they're putting those clothes on and actually, either way, even if this is for a press shoot or, or something that requires something more extravagant, as you mentioned, it's still not the formal wear that it yep. used to be the backbone of celebrity dressing. Yep. Um, and I, I find that fascinating. Um, and then if we're looking at, at further disruption in this space when it comes to press and marketing, I've noticed and you mentioned to me that traditional press, actually, it's not a, it's not a focus for you, is it? No, it, it, it hasn't been. Um, you know, I, I've, you know, just really love working with musicians and, you know, I've worked with, you know, amazing stores and amazing stylists who work with the, the artists. So, you know, my focus has always been on creating clothing that musicians can, can wear, you know, either on the stage where it's, it's, they can shine or if they're doing a front cover or a music video or stuff that they can wear in the studio or when they're traveling. So I've always, that's always been my, you know, I've really thought of my end consumer. Um, that has been my total focus when I've been designing. And naturally, 
naturally from that, you know, you, you do then get organic press about that. But I've never, you know, focused on that. Or, you know, we've never bought adverts in magazines like a lot of traditional fashion brands would do. You know, for us, it's creating unique clothing that the artists and musicians feel comfortable wearing. And then one thing that does remain, which actually I, I quizzed you about this, I was quite, um, I personally was quite surprised by it, that unlike a lot of uh, emerging younger brands, um, you who would focus on direct to consumer as their business model, you still are, uh, the wholesale model is important to you. Yep. Uh, recently you have this brilliant pop-up at Selfridges, um, which I'd love to hear more about, but then also, I'd love to know about your relationship with with those on on the shop floor. How you approach working with wholesale yeah. and how you do it differently. Yeah, you know, I I think um, you know wholesale is really really important to me, and it's something that I respect a lot because I think that um, a lot of the great wholesale shops have given opportunities to young designers and. Um, and I think that when you start off a brand, you know, a lot of people simply just don't know about you, no matter what your clothes are like, they just haven't heard of you. Um, and you do have limited resources. So I think what's wonderful with a lot of the big wholesale accounts is that, you know, that they do take on um, young designers and they do give a spotlight for young designers and that they help curate. Um, young designers and I found that you know in the early days you know I got into H. Lorenzo in Los Angeles and Selfridges early on and I found that you know the, the owners and the buyers of those stores would really give me feedback as well about the collections and, and they would give you you know information which is really wonderful um, which you could take on and, and they really are taking a risk on you in the early days because that they've got their big brands and they can, you know, they can keep selling those big brands. So I think it is important to, to do wholesale. And, you know, and, you know, for me, it has really, really paid off in the sense that, you know, so many people walk through the doors of the greatest stores around the world and, you know, they get to, they get to see your brand. So for me, it's a very important um, to, to showcase your brand um, through that perspective. And I think that, um, a lot of consumers still go to all of these great stores and they're looking to these great stores um, as curators. They want, they go in with open minds and they want to explore and discover new brands. So for me, um, yeah, wholesale is very important. And I think that with my brand and a lot of other brands is we put so much effort into intricate elements of the detail. We put so many artistic processes into each piece that I think um, some of our pieces, you know, should be seen um, in, in the physical reality. And I think that's very important. So um, yeah, wholesale is, is a very important part of our business and will continue to be um, in the future. And do you think that that curated element is something that can only be found in bricks and mortar and can't be found online? Well, I think it's definitely changing, but I think there's a beauty in, in the bricks and mortar of like being able to feel the pieces. And I think that you can, um, the designer and the store can showcase, you know, the, the thought process of the designer in the physical, in the physical space very well. Um, but I think now we're all learning to evolve and, you know, virtual platforms are growing. Um, which is great, you know, and it, it's pushed us in new directions. So for me, there's, there's, there's definitely got to be a balance of like the virtual and also the, the physical spaces. Tell me about, um, tell me about your pop-up at Suffrages actually, talking of the physical spaces. Yeah, so we, we just launched our biggest pop-up to date at Selfridges. It launched last Wednesday. It's been, yeah, truly phenomenal to see. And it's something that um, you know, I'm really proud of like the, the initial idea came about in the first lockdown in, in London. And at times there was a lot of uncertainty whether we would be able to do a physical pop up at all. And for me, there was a natural fear as a designer and regarding my brand. And I think for a lot of people as to the uncertainty of the pandemic and our industry in general. So I actually pushed myself and I wanted to explore a way that I could actually continue to do the physical pop-up and also I pushed myself to try and make it the biggest and best that I've ever done. Um, so we've actually created a 90s arcade in 
side of Selfridges. It's on the, the men's first floor. And, you know, I'm really proud because as a British designer, you know, we're next to Christian Dior, we're next to Prada, we're next to Comme des Garçons um, and Saint Laurent. That's who we're encircled by. So it's been great. And it's wonderful to see on Wednesday just a huge amount of interaction. And I tried to make it as immersive as possible. So we collaborated with two brands, one of them being Mortal Kombat, um, the, the video game, and the other one being Everlast, the iconic boxing brand. So, yeah. so we've created a number of limited edition pieces and we've just made it very, very immersive by bringing in actual pinball machines, um, video game machines, arcades and punch machines. So it's fun and it's wonderful just to see London opening up again on Wednesday when it opened. It's great mm -hmm. to just see people interacting. So um, for me, there are definitely a lot of signs of kind of hope and light um, that, that are emerging from this dark tunnel. Well, that's... There's very um, there's a very positive tone and and um, one as our final speaker of 2020 that's a very good point to mention. You're mentioning collaborations. We've been talking about it throughout. So just recently, the ones you did with Selfridges, but there there have been so many highlights um, through your career thus far with fantastic collaborators. Um, where do you strike the balance between increasing your audience and and trying not to devalue the brand? So how do you ensure that your collaborative partners are the right ones for you? Yeah, I, I think that we've now, I think because of all the musicians and artists we've worked with, we've, we've been able to choose and pick and get asked by amazing brands um, to work with. So we're lucky in the sense that we have a lot of choice. And, and a lot of the times we actually say no, because it doesn't just, it doesn't fit with us as a brand. I think what's important for me is that um, that there's an excitement to it. You know, often I, I like working with brands that I was really into when I was younger. And it's almost like there's a side of me that um, it's almost, yeah, it's just fun. It's, it's almost like a dream. I then also um, like to work with new audiences and try and push audiences. Um, so I know my audience and then the audience of the other brand. And I think it's always interesting when you can collaborate with another brand and you can merge audiences. And I think it opens the minds up of the audiences. And then I like to do collaborations that push myself to as a designer and my team. Um, so working with brands and, and you know, um, learning from what, what is the heritage of the brand, um, what, what makes it unique, what makes it different, and then integrating those elements with the uniqueness of my brand and coming up with something super interesting, limited edition. So, that's, um, yeah, that's really key for me. And in terms of, we keep, we've said previously in this discussion that fashion industry, the fashion industry is notoriously closed doors. What yep. can the fashion industry learn from collaboration? I think, I think there's, there's um, you know, I think it's something I brought up earlier where I felt like the fashion industry has sometimes stolen ideas um, mm -hmm. from other brands. And I think that collaboration is all about respecting that another brand has a certain strength and you have a certain strength and that they're different strengths and that together you can create something really special so i think that's that acceptance of you know i'm good at something you're good at something you know and and you know res that, that self-respect between brands which i think is is really really key um and then i think yeah just understanding that um all brands are different and equal, just like human beings, and that we can all learn from each other. You know, I think, you know, we've all got a heritage. So it's super interesting to bring different heritages, like cultures together um, to create something super interesting. As it's the final, as we're reaching year end, um, I would love to ask where you see your brand in another five years time. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think with me, we're, we're evolving all of the time. And so I'm definitely, you know, very open to how things will evolve. And, and I, I know that will continue. So if you'd asked me three years ago where, where I saw the brand now, um, I couldn't have ever thought I'd be doing what I'm doing now. So I know that will continue. I really, really love working with musicians and artists. And I've really missed um, the live side of, of my work. So I used to create a lot of um, different collections and pieces for artists who were going on tour. 
So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to progressing in that aspect. I was also close to doing, you know, merchandise for, for certain bands as well as doing stage outfits. So I'm looking forward to that continuing. And yeah, I'm just really looking forward to doing more and more collaborations and just and just evolving. Um, and we're already, you know, you know, an international brand. We're in 20 countries, but I'm looking forward to kind of um, building the brand internationally. And I see that as a really exciting challenge. So um, so that's that's really epic. Yeah. And not only in 20 countries, but in you've ch I know you've cherry picked the cities in those countries and the wholesalers. Right. Yeah, and, and, and we've been very careful not to um, not to have too many stockists, you know, so it's a maximum of two per city um, and we always space them out. So so we've been very you know careful uh, with that. Interesting. Um, one question that we always ask each of our pioneer speakers before we go to the floor. And there are a lot of questions I have seen have come through. Um, what is your hope for the industry? My hope is that, that a lot of the young designers um, continue with what they're doing because I think that there are definitely barriers in the industry for young designers. And I just, um, it always upsets me when I hear about people who have stopped doing something they love um, or discontinued a dream. So, you know, my main hope is that a lot of the, the young people out there um, continue with their ideas, you know, and, and their dreams and, and, and keep going for it. Because I think we learn so much. And I think that, um, yeah, it's just very important that we encourage and we help, you know, younger designers um, continue um, to design and not give up on their, their hopes and dreams. Because the reality is, is that um, I think for younger brands right now, it is going to be harder over the next year. I think, um, you, know, you know, I've seen a lot of friends who have sadly lost their jobs and, you know, they've had much tougher times recently. So I think that, um, you know, consumers are going to naturally go towards brands they're very familiar with. So I think that it could potentially be one of the toughest times um, to start a new brand. So, so for me, it's that hope that, um, yeah, just people can continue doing what they love. Because I know with, with fashion brands, people put so much into it. And it, it's a very personal business where people put a lot of their personality into the business and, and, and show themselves up um, emotionally. So yeah, that, that, that's the kind of wish. And I, and I think secondly, um, an understanding of the industry of how we can, you know, learn and minimize the impact to the environment and become more responsible um, with how we're designing and creating and showing. And I think naturally the industry has been um, wasteful and I think that it's time that everyone accepts responsibility and starts to evolve and change and I've seen it naturally with with the younger generation um, the Gen Z you know how they look at things and I'm super optimistic for the future about that yeah because actually it, it I haven't covered it but it's worth saying your core demographic is Gen Z and millennial right yeah yeah no we we've got a lot of um, yeah a lot of our consumers are are younger and you know a lot of the musicians we we you know we work with and dress that they're, they're super young um and and it's only getting younger i think with the power of instagram and tiktok i'm just seeing um a natural evolution of just younger and younger clientele um and just younger and younger artists breaking through at like 16 17 18 19 so um yeah it's influencing the whole market now right I think it is time to dig into these questions. Rachel, right. if you can back on and you can share, um, I look forward to seeing what everyone said. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for that, Mark. We've had so many questions come through and we've also been emailed quite a few in advance of the talk today as well. So I'm gonna do my best to get through them. Let, let's see how right. we can. Um, first of all, from um, Miss Kay, and, and thank you, because I know that you also sent this one on email. Thank you for being here tonight and now, and now posting it as well. Um, she asks, what advice would you give someone who is pursuing their passion, but cannot fully sustain themselves financially from it yet? So whilst they're working on developing the brand, what advice you would have? Yeah, I, I, think, I think firstly, you've got to understand that nearly everyone started in that position. Mm. And I think it's you've got to have that extreme hunger and desire and resilience to let nothing get, you know, stand in your way. 
and in your ground. And, you know, everyone has the same 24 hours a day. So it's, it's really personal choice. You know, often you are going to have to have that nine to six job. But then it's like, how do you use that time in the evenings on the weekends? You know, are you going to watch movies in the evening? Are you going to go out with friends? Um, you know, you've got to make certain choices. Like with me, a big part of, of, of what I do was socializing and going out. You know, I take out a lot of artists and actors and musicians. But one of the rules that I created for myself was like, I wasn't going to drink or, or smoke. Um, and, and, and that choice enabled me to then not be hung over the next day and to be able to work. So I think that you've got to um, just get on with it, basically. And I think sometimes we can naturally feel sorry for ourselves and be like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work really hard, um, but, you know, I'm not making enough money. Um, but yeah, I think it's just keep, keep going for it, you know, stay strong. And um, yeah, and sometimes you've just got to do what you've got to do. You've got to do one or two extra jobs and you've got to work on the weekends when all your friends are partying. And um, but yeah, just keep going. A lot of hustle going on. I love that. Thank you. Um, some of these questions I think we have covered in the main in the main conversation. So so apologies to people if it's seeming like I'm not getting to them, but I want to make sure that we get to the ones that haven't been covered specifically. This is a really nice one from Roger, and I should just say Roger is one of our young pioneers. So he's on our mentoring program, and he also right. does have his own streetwear brand. His question is: Do you think streetwear brands that have gone from a grassroots community vibe to a very successful large business isolate the community they were once very in touch? with that's a really good question and i think i think it's something that naturally yes does evolve as you grow bigger i think um naturally the grassroots you know level of the business i think it's tougher just to be as connected it's the same thing with musicians like i see a lot of musicians start off super small grassroots um and they blow into superstars but I think, I think, you know, some brands will lose that touch and that sense and others will maintain it. And I think, you know, the brands that do maintain it are the ones that will continue to thrive in the long run. Um, because, yeah, I, I think a lot of brands will, will yeah, lose touch, but s some will continue to remain. And I think that's what will separate the truly authentic brands from um, those that are not is whether they can keep in touch with that core audience. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I guess so much of this, as you've mentioned actually previously in the conversation, does come down to that piece around authenticity. Yeah. Um, on that note, there's a really nice couple of questions here. I'm going to combine them, one from Janice and one from Glenn, which basically asks um, which things or who do you draw inspiration on um, when you're designing your collections? And the other way around is um, who were your early fashion influencers? So maybe a combination answer there. Yeah, so no, those are two really good questions. I think, um, you know, how I started and how I've continued is for me, it's always been very important to look at other sources of inspiration outside of the fashion world. So for me, I really love um, Jean-Michel Basquiat. I loved his art. Um, I loved how he almost had a childlike um, simplicity to his drawing and almost um, a lack of care of what others thought. And he just created pieces that he wants to create. So I, I love that element. And then, you know, I used to work with different artists, street artists, and I used to love how, you know, they would create distinct icons such as like Nick Walker and D-Face and even Banksy. Um, they created characters that naturally evolved. So I've always tried to integrate art into my pieces. So that's been a really powerful influence um, for me. So, so yeah, so I think, you know, looking at the art world and integrating processes into that. And we've also tried to integrate techniques into um, clothing that have naturally come from the art world. So we do a lot of silk screen printing, we hand spray paint pieces. So that's been, that's been really interesting for us. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. That's really great. Um, we have a question now specifically about products. Jason asks, right. re regarding specific products, you initially started with custom leather jackets, as we heard. Yes. And then you've had massive success with your hoodies. Recently, yep. you've had huge buzz regarding your stack pants with celebs like Chris Brown wearing them. Do you believe that product will become a signature piece for you in future collections? Yeah, I think that with, um, with fashion, there's a beautiful fine balance between having really special products that celebrities can wear and then also creating products that can become commercial. So there's a fine balance. So our first product that really made a hit was our, our double hoodies. 
and they've really developed. And then we created a second one. And then, yeah, the new one is the stack pants. So that's our skinny jeans. It's got lots of layers to it. And a lot of artists have been starting to wear them. So um, that is something that has just naturally um, been taken up by a lot of superstars. So I'm sure that the stack pant will continue to develop um, and build momentum. Excellent, thank you. Um, one from George, he says, would you say that streetwear brand bubbles are simply more effective than traditional brands at delivering messaging, engagement and driving desirability? Ultimately, he says they understand their audiences so much better and are capable of responding to their wants and needs. Yeah, I think I think that a lot of the kind of streetwear brands um, are younger and they're just truly authentic. And so they really, truly they are also their consumers, you know, the, the, a lot of the designers and a lot of the people are part of those cultures and they have genuine interests. So they just understand and they live and breathe it truly. It's, they're not marketing, they're just creating um, product that they themselves would want. So I think they have a really, really strong understanding of, of, of what um, their demographic wants. Yeah, and I suppose that flows quite nicely to another question from, from Glenn, which is then really about marketing. He says, if you don't use mainline press, do you use much social media to reach your target market? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that, um, you know, social media is incredibly important for us. Um, but it's something that once again, we do very organically in the sense that due to the product we're creating, due to the people that are naturally wearing the brand, that are buying it, wearing it, um, it creates really organic content. So for us, that's, you know, it stems, everything stems from creating really special product. And then that product then does a lot of the work for you in the sense that the best stores want to stock it. Um, incredible people want to wear it at incredible occasions. And that just creates a really organic um, form of social media. So that's, that's the process for us. Yeah, I love that. It all comes back down to that creativity piece and focusing on the product, as you say, with that, yeah, that element of authenticity throughout, which is a really lovely message, especially as I know there's a lot of people on this on this call that um, on this webinar that are indeed um, owners of their own small businesses and brands. So that, that's, I'm sure, incredibly helpful for them. Um, we touched on sustainability during the main conversation. You mentioned it there in terms of obviously the, the business model itself and that sort of scarcity piece. Um, and, and, and you mentioned it there at the end in terms of your hope and, and what you want to see the industry transform towards. We have another question here that is specifically about that. And I wonder if we can just maybe take this conversation a little bit further. Yep. Um, Angeliki asks us, what do you think about streetwear and sustainability? Do the classic sustainability strategies like sustainable materials, for example, match the culture of streetwear? I think that they they naturally are evolving to, to match. I, I'm seeing it just naturally with the younger consumer and we've had some really great um, younger designers come on board. And now I think the younger consumers have a real awareness and understanding of how clothing is now made and the impact it has on the environment. Five, 10 years ago, people would look at products and they were just, they were solely interested in did it, did it look cool? Was it special? Was it a collaboration? Was it rare? And now there's a real, real interest into how items of clothing are made. And I know mm. that that thought process is only going to grow. And I know that certain consumers now are not buying certain items because of how they're made. They may respect them. They may want them. They may desire them, but they simply will not buy them because of the way they've been made. So I'm only seeing that movement just grow and grow and get stronger and stronger. And I think, um, you know, from my perspective as a designer and a brand owner, uh, a couple of years ago, even if you wanted to be um, sustainable, it was actually very difficult. And now I think that there's such a growing demand. I think all designers are now starting to embrace it and it's growing. And it's definitely not perfect and there's a long way to go um, for, for myself and, and all the brand owners, but there's now this awareness and I think um, it's just changing and only gonna grow. So I'm, I'm super confident about the future. Yeah, I love that. Lots of power in the people as they say. Yeah. Um, one final question before we hand back to Rosanna, one that's just come in. Um, he says, hi, Mark, you seem like a natural communicator. I love this question, actually. It's a really nice one to end on. You've got an amazing skill building relationships with people and worked with some great talents. Do you have any tips on building relationships and networking? Yeah, so so um, 
relationships has been one of the most important parts of of what I've done um, with the brand. And I I wouldn't call it networking. Um, you know, for me, networking, I don't like that term. For me, it's all about building genuine relationships and genuinely caring about the other person. And, you know, with my brand, you know, some of the strongest relationships I have are with um, the buyers or the owners of wholesale stores or some of the stylists to some of the biggest artists in the world. And, you know, when I'm working with them, I'm always trying to think of like, how can I make that person shine? You know, how can I do something that will help that person? So with the stylists, you know, they're looking to get unique pieces that mm -hmm. for their artists that no one else has. So, um, you know, it's the same for the shops. They're looking for interesting clothing that other stores don't have. How can you create unique pieces? So I think, you know, it's always key to, to try and help other people as, as best as you can and, and to look at the world through through their perspective. So. I think I think that's that's yeah the real key and just building long term relationships and another thing that I think is always great is is connecting to other people. Um, so I've always tried to do that as much as possible is connect different people um, that I know will get on and can help each other and in turn you naturally get connected to other people. Yeah. So um, so I think you need to look at relationships um, through the eyes of abundance as well, because I think a lot of people can be quite possessive of their relationships and not want to share them. And I've actually found the opposite is that the more you can introduce people, um, the more you actually get introduced back. So it, it just works out positively for, for everyone. Indeed, I couldn't agree with that more, the very premise of Fash Mash itself. So yes, maybe maybe people on the call would like to become a member. That would definitely help in that regard as well. Mark, it feels like the perfect note to end on. Thank you so, so much for being here. Just a quick note before I hand back to Rosanna to close us out, just to say thank you to everyone else for being here as well, and also to our sponsor, Clavio, once more. Um, we wish you all a really very um, wonderful festive break. That is, of course, now upon us, though it may not feel like it. Um, and we really look forward to seeing you in 2021 we've got a really exciting lineup of new speakers which we will announce very soon so thank you very much and I'll hand back over to Rosanna to finish. Thank you so much Rachel I love what you just said Mark about um the abundance of contacts and yes brilliant yeah okay quick fire are right. you ready? I am ready. Excellent hoodie or biker jacket? Both you can't do that, but okay. You know, you get I, I, one. I, on that, it's it's a both. I'm sorry. Acid color or monochrome? Acid. Nightclub or intimate dinner? It used to be nightclub. It's now switched to intimate dinner. On that note, actually, frozen margarita or Fiji water? Fiji water. Mark and I have been friends for years. I I know him too well. It would seem luxury or mass. Luxury or mass? Um, mass. Rap or rock? Rap. 2020 or 2030? 2030. Brilliant. What a fantastic future gazing note on which to end. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. And I loved all your questions. That's the most we've ever received. So very engaging topic and pioneering speaker clearly um we will see you all in 2021 thank you mark thanks a lot it's been great thanks for everyone who tuned in and yeah have an amazing <laughs> holiday christmas and yeah see you all in 21 thank you bye bye